morning, everybody. Welcome to the budget committee meeting this morning. I have a couple of things to announce before we go any further. Any member of the public wishing to speak further regarding an issue on the 2018 budget committee agenda for today may appear before council at its meeting on December 18th, 2017 at 7 p.m. when the recommendations from this meeting will go forward for final consideration. If you wish to speak as a delegation, please sign the sheet located at the back of the room or notify the clerk's department no later than noon the day of the council meeting. Any PowerPoint presentations must also be forwarded to the clerk's department no later than noon the day of the meeting. Do we have any regrets? I see none. And uh, welcome to other members of council that are here this morning. Uh, this morning we have a presentation dealing with both the operating and capital budget as well as the rates and fees. And uh, Nancy Sully, you're going to start us off, correct? We'll take a quick break after the operating budget component, ask if there's any questions and then move on, all right? Oh, and uh, before you go and while you're getting that set up, I'll ask if there are any declarations of pecuniary interest. I see none. Hello? Ten oh, sounds like it's on now. Okay. Good morning. The 2018 budget process began back in the spring. We held our first budget committee meeting in June where the chair of the budget committee was elected. We also reviewed the guidelines and looked at the forecast for 2018. Uh, hold on, I think we're having audio oh. okay. issues. Can we uh, increase the volume, please? You can't hear me? Either that or Nancy has to use her stage voice. Okay, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Oh, okay, hello. All right, so we're, today's the second meeting of the 2018 Budget Committee and just wanted to remind everyone of the guideline that Council set for us, that for 2018, 19 and 20, that the budget be prepared with an overall increase in line with inflation. The budget I'm presenting today has been prepared in accordance with that direction. My presentation will provide an overview of the operating and capital budgets, as well as a brief overview of the rates and fees, which are also included on today's agenda. I'm not sure what's happening with the presentation up there. Working on it, so I'll carry, I'll carry on, sorry. Um, our commissioner presentations are scheduled for Thursday, and we have two meetings next week for budget delegations, deliberations on December the 12th, and final council approval is targeted for December the 18th. So council set a guideline for us of an overall increase in line with inflation. For the 2018 budget, the target's been set at 2%, in line with the mid-range of the Bank of Canada's inflation target. Budget I'm presenting today results in an overall increase of 1.94%. It ensures the programs and services that are valued by our residents and the town's strong financial position is maintained. It also ensures sufficient funding for infrastructure renewal and accommodates new growth in our parks and roads. Our budget continues to be prepared using performance-based, program-based budgeting methodology. Our focus is on the programs and the outcomes that those programs are delivering. And for the reader's benefit in our business plans, there are performance measures for each of our programs showing five-year trends. As well, the Livable Oakville dashboard includes 29 measures that show the town's progress towards its goal of being the most livable town in Canada. The updated measures are now available on the website to coincide with the release of the budget. And in 2017, the town achieved ISO 37120 Platinum Certification from the World Council on City Data. ISO 37120, Sustainable Development of Communities, Indicators for City Services and Quality of Life, is comprised of 100 performance measures that track the progress in delivering services and ensuring quality of life for the community. Platinum Certification acknowledges that the town has achieved the highest standard in data collection and research to drive the delivery of high quality programs and services to our community. Oh. oh boy. Sorry, it's going the wrong way here. Okay, sorry. 
As a lower tier municipality, the town is one portion of the tax bill representing just under 41%. And while I'm focusing on that 41% of the tax bill, the guideline that Council gave us will ensure that residents see an increase on their tax bill in line with inflation. This is our budget at a glance. The gross expenditures in the 2018 proposed budget total $321.5 million. This is the cost of running the town's programs and services. Our non-tax revenue totals $133.8 million, and that includes program-specific revenue such as user fees, as well as revenues that are more corporate in nature, such as investment income. And the difference between our gross expenditures and non-tax revenue is the tax levy requirement, which for 2018 is $187.7 million. Oh. I really just touched that once, <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going on here. Sorry, now it's not even moving. I apologize, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, when we're preparing the budget, there are several budget pressures that always have to be dealt with. And this year is no exception. In addition to normal inflation, we have also have to deal with the minimum wage increase. The province of Ontario has announced that the minimum wage is increasing from $11.60 an hour to $14 an hour beginning January 1st, 2018. As we have a significant uh, number of part-time staff, this has had an increased pressure on our budget. It's also provided increased pressure on the cost recovery of some of our programs. As well, we've had to deal with volume fluctuations in some of our programs. And transit ridership. For 2017, our transit ridership has been running about 5% above 2016 levels, but it is running below the 2017 budget. As a result, we've had to make an adjustment to transit revenue in the 2018 budget. And software maintenance cost is a growing pressure on our budget as many of the major software vendors are switching to software as a service, which is putting added pressure on the operating budget. I don't know what's happening. Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about some of these pressures. The first one being the minimum wage increase. When I presented the budget forecast in June, we estimated the increase to have an impact of $1.4 million on our budget. We have been able to mitigate that slightly by about $300,000 by changing the way that we're budgeting within the bands. But we have been able to keep the integrity of the part-time grid intact. This is very important as it helps to minimize the risk of compression issues as we move forward. We've also increased fees where possible to help mitigate the impact, but it does add pressure to the cost recovery on some of our programs. I mentioned that we had to do an adjustment to the transit uh, revenue budget. This has resulted in a reduction in revenue of about $800,000. However, Transit has taken a careful look at all of the routes and through detailed analysis has been able to introduce efficiencies in the proposed budget to mitigate this impact. As well, through the use of gas tax, they've been able to introduce some service improvements and keep the Transit budget in line with the 2017 tax levy requirement. And on Thursday, Commissioner Bell will provide more information on the efficiencies and the service enhancements that have been incorporated in the Transit budget. There's been a great deal of focus on the cost recovery of our programs to ensure that they're as close to their targets as possible. Under our rates and fee policy, all of our fees we undergo a review once every four years to ensure that cost recovery is maintained. This year, our recreation fees were reviewed. This was particularly important as this program has seen the greatest impact from the minimum wage increase. In addition to dealing with the pressures on wage increases, Staffing in the program has had to be increased as well to match the program delivery and the demand for service. The review has shown that some of the services within recreation are not meeting the approved cost recovery targets. Our fees have been increased between 5 and 6 percent in most of the programs to help close the gap, and we have used tax stabilization funding to further mitigate the impact on the budget. The stabilization funding is temporary and will be removed as the program costs and fees are further reviewed over the next two years. There is a report on the November 23rd agenda that outlines the growth in our recreation programs as well as where they are in comparison to the cost recovery targets. And further information will be provided on Thursday during the Commissioner presentations. 
The other budget pressure has been the fluctuation in planning and development revenues that you see throughout a planning cycle. And last year I did mention that going forward there would be significant pressure on our budget as the planning enterprise reserve would be fully utilized. To mitigate the impact of fluctuations, we have moved towards budgeting based on average revenue. We've adjusted this where necessary based on things we know will affect revenue in the coming year. And we are, uh, we are asking that variances over or under average revenues would be offset by a transfer to or from the tax stabilization as we go forward. The budget presented today provides the necessary funding to maintain the programs and services that are valued by our residents. It includes funding to accommodate cost pressures on the budget. It also includes funding for the operating impacts of completed capital projects. And it includes our 1% capital levy. The levy has been in place since 1996 and provides a growing source of funding to ensure capital investments are that are required to maintain our infrastructure in a state of good repair are fully funded. For budget purposes in 2018, we have assumed 1% in new assessment growth. Assessment growth generates new taxes without increasing the tax levy. It results from new properties that have been added to the roll during 2017 or additions or improvements to existing properties. Similar to the recommendation in 2017, we are recommending that every, any assessment revenue in excess of 1% be transferred to the tax stabilization reserve. Over the next several years, we have several new or expanded facilities that will become operational, including the Trafalgar Park site, Southeast Community Centre, Fire Station 8, a permanent Fire Station 9, an expanded Fire Station 4, as well as a new library. All of these facilities will put pressure on the operating budget, and by putting the money in tax stabilization, we'll be able to pull that into the budget the year those facilities become operational. For town purposes, the base budget increase after 1% assessment growth is 2.04%. That's for the existing programs and services and also the operating cost of completed capital projects. The capital levy adds an additional 1%, bringing the total town increase to 3.04%, or 1.23% on the overall tax bill. When the region of Halton's proposed increase of 1.9% is added in, it brings the overall increase to 1.94%, or $15.47 per hundred thousand of assessment. This shows how our $321.5 million in gross expenditures are broken down by program. Our largest portion of expenditures is in our corporate revenue and expense section, and that includes all the funding for capital, transfers to reserves, etc. This is followed by recreation and culture, emergency services, and infrastructure maintenance. This is the gross cost of operating those programs. The net tax levy is $187.7 million. This shows how that's broken down between the various programs. The net program budgets differ from the allocation of gross expenditures as many of our programs have user fees which offset some of the cost. Our largest program is emergency services at $36.3 million. This is followed by infrastructure maintenance at $22.2 million and transit at $22 million. <coughs> sometimes it moves, sometimes it doesn't. Of every $100 in taxes that are paid by our residents, $24 goes towards infrastructure renewal to maintain our buildings, facilities, our equipment in a state of good repair. $19 goes towards emergency services, 13 to our road network, 12 to transit, all the way down to $1 for municipal enforcement. The net program increase in the proposed budget is $7.3 million. This chart shows the breakdown by program. The largest increase is in our corporate revenue and expenses, and that's the 1% capital levy that's shown there. Emergency services and our operating programs is, has the largest increase. This is driven by wage increases. For information systems and support, the systems, they support all of our town software. Approximately 83% of the increase in this program relates to software maintenance and software as a service contract increases. 
This includes the costs related to Microsoft, J.D. Edwards, Amanda, Class, and the many other programs that are used by town departments. The next highest increase is in the Recreation and Culture Program. This program has been affected by the minimum wage increase, which adds over $700,000 to the program's budgets. The fee increases proposed for this program reflect the impact the minimum wage increase has on the cost of delivering services. And in our planning and development programs, the increase relates to the change in the way we're budgeting the revenue. As I mentioned earlier, we are now budgeting based on average income, average revenue, sorry. The reserve transfer, which was used to bring the program to cost recovery under the previous methodology, has been removed, and variances over or under budget will be offset by a transfer to or from the stabilization reserve if required. The balance of the increase is spread amongst the many remaining programs. Of our gross expenditures, 48% is, is driven by personnel services and benefits. That's followed by minor capital and transfers to reserves. That includes the $31 million that's transferred to the capital budget from operating, as well as all of the funding that goes into our reserves. Based on the staff recommended budget, taxation accounts for 58% of the revenues to support the budget. This is followed by our fees and charges, which is the second largest funding source in our 2018 budget at $71.5 million, or 22% of funding. There were five items that were referred to Budget Committee when the budget documents were being prepared. Since that time, there's an additional one, the Gypsy Moss Spraying, which has also been referred. It's all of these, the Fire Master Plan, Event Strategy, Flashing 40, the Pedestrian Safety Program, and the Cultural Plan Implementation. On today's agenda, the Budget Overview Report includes as an appendix each of the original reports for these to refresh Council's mind. And then the November 23rd agenda includes supplementary reports where applicable for these items. And the commissioners will speak to them on Thursday. The overall impact of the proposed budget is 1.94%. The budget meets Council's guideline, it's fiscally sustainable, and ensures the programs and services valued by our residents are maintained, and spending that reflects the public's priorities. It also ensures sufficient funding to operate and maintain new infrastructure and the funding to maintain our existing infrastructure. The budget documents have been distributed today. They're also posted on the town's website. In addition to the executive summary, the document includes business plans for each of our programs. The business plans provide an overview of the program, key facts related to their budget, as well as performance measures showing five-year trends. The 2018 capital budget and detail sheets along with information on reserves, debt, and town staff complement are also included in the document. The 2019 and 2020 forecasts are being presented at this time to give Council and the Budget Committee a look at what we're looking at in the future. There are several uh, uh, facilities that are going to become operational over the next coming years, and they provide the greatest pressure on the budget in 2019 and 20. And this just shows a list of some of those facilities that will be opening. As well, we have incorporated the phase in of the municipal enforcement strategy. However, no other new service enhancements are included in the 2019 and 2020 forecasts. Based on where we're at at this time, this chart shows the forecasted increase for 2019 and 20, as well as the 2018 requested budget. For 2019 and 2020, Council has set a target of an overall increase in line with inflation. To meet that target, we have set a reduction target for 2019 and 2020. This target will need to be met in order to ensure that the budget that's prepared comes in line with the guideline that Council has given us. And I'll stop here. This is the end of the operating budget, and if you wish, we can answer members, any questions. Members of the committee and council, do you have any questions at this point? You're welcome to ask them now. If not, we'll come back and ask questions again when we're done. Councilor Lisgina. Nancy, can you comment on the interest and penalties, the 6% for the funding sources? Uh, what does that so consist of? That would include penalty and interest on taxes, so unpaid taxes. Uh, are charged 15% annually, so there's funding from that. There would be any interest, um, uh, it, I have to go back to the slides. 
to me exactly. It's primarily the penalty and interest on taxes. That's the bulk of that. And is that because people forget to pay on time, or are we talking about hardship? Uh, what, what would be common reasons for that? So there, there is um, a range, and I, I, off the top of my head, I, I don't have it, but I could bring it back to you in a future meeting. But there's, there's always um, some people that don't pay on time for various reasons. Um, if it was to exceed a certain percentage, it might indicate that there's some pressures on residents that they can't afford the taxes. We're not in that case. Our, our penalty and interest on taxes as a percentage of unpaid taxes is not out of the normal range at all. But there are always people that, for whatever reason, don't pay on time and, and are charged interest. Any others? Okay, why don't we move on with the capital element okay. and we'll come back. The next few slides are on the 2018 capital budget. I'm only presenting the 2018 capital budget at this time as our 10-year forecast is currently being finalized in, in conjunction with our development charge background study. The 10-year forecast will be brought back to the budget committee in early February along with the development charge background study. In total, the 2018 capital program accounts for $128.4 million. The largest share of our budget is infrastructure renewal. This is followed by growth and community enhancements. This shows the capital spending for the 2018 program. Our largest program is infrastructure planning, which includes funding for roads, bridges, stormwater projects, and active transportation. This is closely fo followed by our recreation and culture program, which includes funding for the Trafalgar Park revitalization and the Southeast Community Center. Our infrastructure renewal includes road resurfacing and repairs and maintenance to roads. Our library capital program includes a temporary branch at North Park, as well as a major renovation and the construction of a digital hub at the Glen Abbey Library branch. And our fire budget includes the construction of Station 8, as well as the design for Station 4. shows our funding sources for our 2018 capital budget. The largest source of funding is capital reserves at $34.1 million. This is closely followed by development charges, which is used to fund our growth projects, and the capital levy at $31.3 million. Together, these three funding sources account for over three quarters of the funding in our capital budget. This shows the largest uh, projects in the capital budget, the top 10. The first two are the Trafalgar Park revitalization and the Southeast Community Center. As well, there are several road projects. There's funding for our EAB and land for the Fire Station 9, the permanent station, as well as a new library branch in North Oakville. We are projecting our reserve and reserve fund balances to total $293.3 million at the end of 2018. This is based on a projected 2017 ending balance as identified in our third quarter financial report, which will be presented to Council on December the 11th. It also incorporates the transfers to and from reserves that are included in our 2018 budget. The development charge reserve fund balance is based on our projected permit activity for 2018. And you can see there is a drop in our reserves that's primarily related to the capital reserve and it reflects the funding for the Trafalgar Park and the Southeast Community Centers as the major source of funding for those is the capital reserve. Our outstanding debt is projected to be $118.8 million at the end of 2018, down slightly from 2017 levels. There is no new debt being proposed in the 2018 capital budget. The only debt to be issued is the debt that was approved for phase two of the LED street light program in 2017. And I do want to note that those debt charges are being paid through electricity savings through the LED implementation. The last portion of my presentation is on the proposed rates and fees. The report in the agenda today provides highlights of the various fees, as well as the proposed rates and fees schedule for all of our town programs and services. Each year as part of our process, we review the rates and fees to ensure that they're reflecting the cost of delivering our programs. 
The fees have been posted on the town website since November the 3rd. They've also been advertised in the Oakville Beaver. While most of our fee increases will take effect January the 1st, there are some that will take effect later in the year. And the rates and fee schedule shows the effective date for all of the rates and fees. And while I'm presenting the fees today at the first meeting of the Budget Committee, they're being presented for consideration as part of the deliberations which will take place on December the 12th. And as requested in past years, the fee schedules indicate the cost recovery target and where applicable, how co close to those targets the fees are. Sorry. We have reviewed, reviewed all of the fees and, st and we have increased them where applicable, but staff are very cognizant of affordability of our programs and a great deal of care is taken when raising the fees. The minimum wage increase has had a significant impact on the cost of delivering recreation programs and maintaining our sports fields. As a result, fee increases in those programs are higher than inflation to reflect the increased burden on the cost of delivering them. For the remaining programs, most are at an inflationary rate. And in total, the increased revenue from the fee increases is $1.3 million, and it has been included in the budget I'm presenting today. The budget documents have been distributed today and are now posted on our website. We've scheduled commissioner presentations for Thursday to provide further information on the various programs that I've highlighted today. As well, there are two public delegations next week and deliberations on December the 12th and council approval December 18th. And there are many ways for the public to take part in our process. In addition to the public delegation meetings, there are two budget open houses that have been scheduled, which will provide an informal setting for residents to provide information or ask questions regarding the budget. As well, our budget email is open to all residents to ask questions. And all the meetings have been televised or will be televised. And that includes my overview of the 2018 operating and capital budgets. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Members of the committee, Councillor Elgar. Thank you very much for the presentation. I wonder if we could add an additional slide uh, going forward related to uh, impact of the current taxpayers uh, related to development charges which do not cover the cost of growth. Could that figure be added so people can see what the cost of growth is on the existing taxpayers, if we could do that? We can do that, sure. I, I appreciate that. The only other thing, um, uh, well, I haven't had a chance to read the book, I just got it this morning, but related to the LED program, I'm receiving complaints that, there, that people feel they're dangerous at certain intersections, the lights aren't bright enough, and uh, they're afraid there's going to be a terrible accident. And I think I heard that they're not going to add new poles, but they're going to look into it in another year. And I had a couple of residents say that they're, they're worried that that may be too long before there's a serious accident. Is there, is there a, any chance that could be moved forward a little bit if there's specific areas of concern? Maybe I should let en Enrico speak to that question. Thank you. Good morning uh, to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, we are. So as those areas of concern come up, we are uh, we are reviewing them, and the project team is reviewing them. Um, there are a number of options that we're we're looking at. Um, installation of poles is is an option. Um, we will be reporting back to council in the spring uh, with with respect to that. In, in fairness, if there's a serious concern. Could it be speeded up if, there, if, you, if you go out and you do see that, yes, this is, a, this is a big area? I think you may have seen a couple already from me on that. Um, if there is a concern, yes, we, we will act. Uh, to date, um, we haven't seen or we haven't um, really the concerns has, have been related to the, the change in the color of the light which provides a bit of a contrast change. So, so it, it's really, with respect to that, it's really not, ha it has not been a safety concern. Okay, there's just a couple I have. And the other problem is when people are saying they're too bright. So we've got a, we've got a bit of a, it goes both ways on this one, I appreciate it. So I thank you. Okay, any others on the committee here? Okay, uh, Councillor Robinson. 
<clears throat> Thank you. Uh, outer, Har outer Harbor Dockage. Uh, the other day I was talking to some people and they told me that fee was being established at around two million. Now I see it's uh, over three million. Could you tell me more about that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that is just a placeholder in the budget right now until um, the Outer Harbor is finalized. Um, it was an estimate that was prepared early on, and I believe there will be a report coming back to Council in the new year, and it will outline what the costs are associated with it. I'd like in, to, in I'd like, I'd like oh, in December, just, sorry. I'd like to just establish more conversation on that this morning, and I see the Commissioner is here. And I'm also concerned when I hear the Outer Harbor people talking about the fact that uh, stormwater attenuation won't be maintained as well with new docks as it does if we were able to continue to use the original and older docks that are there now. They feel very strongly that they understand what they're talking about and that we need to be careful about these new docks and that there may be some way we should negotiate keeping the old ones. I, had, I don't know. I have asked staff for a meeting on this and nobody's got back to me yet, by the way. Mm. Um, there will be a report coming to Council in December regarding the status of the lease changes uh, both at the federal level and with uh, uh, tenants. Uh, there are um, uh, several major tenants and the negotiations are still not concluded. Um, right now our goal is to conclude the negotiations to have the leases uh, finalized before we bring the report to you in, dis in December. Um, the leases actually expire in April of 2018. Uh, our goal right now is to have the leases in place and then as soon as the leases are in place to start investigating the kinds of questions that you are, you are asking. At this point it's premature for us to have any kind of conversation about uh, the, the, the nature of the docks, the docking fees. Um, uh, it's all um, subject to further consultation and consideration. So, so there have been no decisions made on docks, fees, um, uh, leases, and we will be bringing a final report on the lease to you in December, and then we will carry on with the kinds of questions well, that you're raising uh, then. Mr. Lawrence, I'm, I'm aware that no decisions have been made. I'm just telling you that our staff has met with the AOHS people at least one occasion. I've got a copy of the minutes of that meeting, and they haven't yet met with the Outer Harbor people who have formed a new alliance group. And I would appreciate it if somebody would respond to my request of two or three weeks ago. And I'll terminate the conversation at that. I'll follow up with you offline if that's okay. I don't know about the request you made. I, I, I didn't send it to you. <laughs> that's why I don't know. <laughs> so Thanks. we'll follow up with you if that's okay. Okay, more, more to come on that. Uh, Councillor Grant. Um, in, in slide nine, you, you mentioned, uh, and I'm going, I was waiting for the end of this to do all of my questions, which turns out just to be one now, thankfully. Um, slide nine, you mentioned budget pressures. In slide, uh, slide, slide eight, slide nine, you spell out four of them, but you didn't get to software. Oh, and, okay. and I realize that um, you know, we live in a world now where people look at their phone and an app is like maybe $2. Uh, but if you could expand on what we're facing, I guess, as far as the cost increases. I, I know that software as a service is a big thing now with the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't buy software, it just, it's, you subscribe to it. So I'm wondering if that's some of the pressure that we're facing right now. Uh, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, the change in software from uh, the old school style of going out and buying a package, mounting it on your own server, maintaining it for as long as you can um, to delay the end of life has changed. Um, the whole environment is changing to something called software as a service, where software no longer resides on your, um, on your servers. Uh, it exists in the cloud and you pay a subscription fee. Um, there are many benefits to software as a service, but um, some of the problems that we have is uh, in that you pay a subscription fee, you're no longer able to extend the life beyond the, 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 the expected lifespan of the software. It's always up to date, which is a good thing, but if you're trying to cut costs, it's a very difficult thing to do. 
Um, the second issue with software as a service, and I'll go into this on Thursday a little bit, uh, but the second issue with software as a service is it causes a transition to move software costs from capital. So when it was a, when we go out and buy a big package, it would become a capital purchase and we would install it um, and then it would be operating for the ongoing maintenance. It shifts the cost out of capital into operating. And so you see these, these changes that you've just, just seen in this presentation as we try to move uh, the software implementation from, cap from capital into operating. And um, uh, that's, a, that's a challenge for us. Uh, on the um, other side of it, uh, we would expect to see in the longer term savings as we no longer have to have, um, uh, we no longer have to actually do the maintenance of the software that's paid for in the subscription, but uh, that will be a gradual change that we'll see over years. Again, I guess we'll be hearing more about this on Thursday, so great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Chisholm. Couple questions, uh, um, Nancy. With respect to FTEs within the corporation, how many FTEs are we sitting with that are not fulfilled at this point in time? I would say around 40, would that be the right number? Around 40 are unfilled. So we do budget gapping. So in our corporate section, I, we reduce our personnel costs by putting a line in there for gapping for $850,000. So that means as departments have vacancies during the year, we take that money out of the, the budget dollars out of the department and we book it against that credit line in the corporate section. Mm -hmm. So that, that's sort of how we count for the fact that there's always turnover. As well, mm -hmm. any new positions in 2018 that are going to start at different points in the year, we've gapped those for part of the year as well. So I think our gapping is about $1.2 in total to help account for the fact that there's always vacancies. Is there an assumption with, uh, I would assume, I haven't read the, the book yet, we just got it this morning, with respect to new FTEs being requested by departments, I would assume uh, within the executive management there would be that reallocation process happening prior to coming to council with adding new uh, FTEs to their, uh, their budget? There is a process that's undertaken, so whenever there's a vacancy, the request does go through a vacancy committee and then it goes to EMT for discussion. So there is some of that reallocation um, and there's questions asked about whether a position needs to be filled or whether it needs to be a different position. So that, that work is undertaken. Mm -hmm. Even with that uh, process, it seems apparently there are, there are requests coming for new FTEs in, in the budget. Is that correct? There are some FTEs. They're primarily related to the operating impacts from capital. So as a capital project is completed and you now need to make it operational, there'll be an FTE. So you'll see that in the executive summary, mm -hmm. the number of FTEs there. Okay. Um, as well, there is a staffing adjustment in the recreation program that you will see in the staff complement. And that's to actually deliver the program. So Colleen will talk more about that okay. on Thursday. I guess the, the, the last question is uh, the cost recovery, and, and I'm not sure of this too, and it's with respect to rates and fees. What is the target for cost recovery? I'm going to use recreation for an example. What is the cost recovery? It, it varies depending on the program. So the okay. way our rates and fee policy works, the more that a service is directly of a benefit to the user, they pay more of the cost. So if I was getting a building permit, I'm paying 100% of that cost because I'm benefiting from that. If I am signing up my child for an aquatics program, the cost recovery is set very low because there's a community benefit to that. It's a life-saving yes. skill. So it, it really does vary depending on the program. Thanks, Nancy. And my last question, I apologize. Uh, there's one more other question. The, the capital of, of, uh, of uh, all these major projects, when they're capitalized, is there also um, an addition within the lines of the capital for operating and into the future? Yes, yeah, so there's an operating impact that's shown with the capital project. So when you look at the detail sheets, you will see the proposed operating impact that goes along with that project. So if you're building a new community center, you're going to hire new staff. If you're building a fire station, new firefighters, as well as heat, utilities, all those other things, and a transfer to a reserve to keep that building in a state of good repair. So that is all um, identified in the capital budget and then it goes into the operating budget. So when I talk in the operating budget about the operating impacts of capital, that, that's what it is. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks for the clarification. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, I've got uh, two requests that I'd like our staff to bring forward. One, 
there's been some discussion about a bocce court at Glen Ashton Park that's been going on for some time. Uh, there was a discussion with Chris Mark over the last year with an, a user group, uh, and I wondered if we could bring forward a, a short memo or report on the capital and operating impact of the proposal. Certainly. Okay. And the other is uh, two years ago now, I think it was, we brought forward a uh, capital request list for the federal government with respect to top priorities and um, requests that we would put forward as our top priority lists. Mm -hmm. Can we update that list and provide it uh, so that we can bring it through council appropriately? Yes, we'll include that on the agenda for next week. Thank you. I, I understand that our federal counterparts are uh, continue to work on our behalf to look for opportunities to bring us money and um, we ought to support them by providing mm -hmm. them an approved list of uh, best requests. Certainly. Okay. Um, any other comments, questions at this point? Uh, members of council and, and committee, if you've got uh, material that you would like to review in further detail with staff, please let us know as soon as we can so we can get it uh, get the reports generated and brought forward either on Thursday uh, and if not then uh, to one of the later committee meetings so that we've got the material before us. Uh, we do have a few members of uh, in the audience here who might wish to bring us information today so I'm going to pull the audience. Are there any members of the audience today here who wish to bring information to us on either uh, of our agenda items today? Going once, going twice, done, okay. Uh, very good. If there are no further questions from members of the committee, then members of the committee, we have two agenda items that are formally in front of us. The first is the overview of the 2018 operating and capital budget, and the recommendation is that the overview presentation from the Deputy Treasurer on the 2018 operating and capital budget be received. Could I have a motion to do that, please? Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Uh, all those in favour? That's carried. The second is the 2018 rates and fees. Uh, one, that the rates and fees established in the rates and fees schedule attached as Appendix A to the September 12, 2017 report from the Finance Department be reviewed for implementation on January 1, 2018 and incorporated into the 2018 operating budget. Two, that bylaw 2017-126, the bylaw to provide for the establishment of fees to be charged in the processing of applications made in respect of planning matters subject to supplemental notes and to repeal bylaw 2016-078 be approved. Three, that the amendments to existing bylaws containing fees be presented directly to Council for approval as required. Could I have a motion to that? Uh, thank you, Councillor Giddings. All those in favour? That's carried. Okay, members of committee, we've dealt with the agenda items today. You have your light reading uh, um, to look at over the next day or two. Uh, look forward to working with you on the budget. Uh, we will be back on Thursday morning at 9.30 to go through the staff materials that are presented to us from each of the commissions. If there are specific questions that you've got, let us let them and let us know as soon as you can. Uh, we've got, for members of the public, uh, two delegation days being planned on uh, Tuesday, November 28th and Thursday, November 30th at 9.30 a.m. and at 7 p.m. respectively uh, to hear from the public. Uh, we do have our deliberation day on December 12th, and I will be ho hosting two open houses, one Saturday morning, uh, November 25th, from 10 to 11 at QE Park in the main lobby, and the second Tuesday, December 5th, from 7 to 8 p.m. at the Iroquois Ridge Library in the Creation Zone, so I look forward to discussing things with members of the public at any of those opportunities. Thank you very much, everybody. We're adjourned.